three million years from Earth, the mining ship Red Dwarf. The crew are dead, killed by a radiation leak save for one survivor, his dead bunkmate, and uh, you know what, we've been here before, and you all know the drill. If you want to know what it's like to live and work aboard the Red Dwarf, I've got great news for you. Hit the link in the top right, or in the description below, and it's been neatly covered for you. As for part 2, well, it's time we took a look at life aboard the Jupiter Mining Corporation mining ship, the Red Dwarf, after the accident that killed the entire crew. Wait, are you trying to tell me everybody's dead? <laughs> <laughs> Travelling through deep space for 3 million years is, let's face it, a pretty stupid thing to do. As we all know, space is big, like really, really big. A trip to the corner shop to pick up a pint of milk, in space terms, might as well be an 18 month expedition into the jungle. Aimlessly drifting into the void is a surefire way to get lost and forgotten. What's more, a spacefaring vessel the size of Red Dwarf could clock in a decent cruising speed of 200,000 miles per hour. And thanks to a lack of, well, anything in space, there really is nothing to stop the ship accelerating constantly. Constantly, for 3 million years. Until the moment where the ship can't help but reach the speed limit of the universe. The speed of light. What was that? Um, uh, 11.14 ship time, Dave. No, Harley, what was that flash? We broken the light barrier 22 hours early. Uh, is everyone all right? I can't do it. I can't cope. We're going at the speed of light. My bottle's gone. <laughs> Holly, is everyone all right? No, I'm not. I thought I could navigate at light speed, but I just can't wrap my head round it. <laughs> Gordon oh. Bennett, that was a close one. <laughs> Holly, what's the problem? You're supposed to have an IQ of 6,000, aren't you? Look, we're travelling faster than the speed of light. That means by the time we see something, we've already passed through it. Even with an IQ of 6,000, it's still brown trousers time. At these unprecedented speeds, you can expect things to go... a bit weird. Laws of physics, time and reality go out the window when you're flying past the point of perception, and you might well find yourself facing a version of events that have yet to have happened. Brace yourself for a bit of a shot, Lister, but I just saw you die. What? I didn't want you to brace yourself. <laughs> you didn't give me much of a chance. I gave you ample bracing time. No, you didn't. You didn't even pause. Well, I'm sorry. I've just had a rather nasty experience. I have just seen someone I know die in the most hideous, hideous way. <laughs> yeah, me? Even at normal speeds, in the deep unknown of the void, you never know when you might come across some sort of weird anomaly capable of altering the very fabric of the universe. So what is it? I've never seen one before. No one has, but I'm guessing it's a white hole. A white hole? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. A black hole sucks time and matter out of the universe. A white hole returns it. Is that thing spewing time back into the universe? Precisely. That's why we're experiencing these curious time phenomena on board. So what is it? I've never seen one before. No one has, but I'm guessing it's a white hole. A white hole? Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. A black hole sucks time and matter out of the universe. A white hole returns it. Is that thing spewing time back into the universe? Precisely. That's why we're experiencing these curious time phenomena on board. What time phenomena? Like just then, when time repeated itself. So what is it? <laughs> Only joking. And then there's the multiverse as a whole, but Smeg, we could go on all night with that. At the end of the day, when the technicalities of flying through space aren't quite enough to distract you, should you find yourself as the last remaining member of the human race, there are going to be a few hurdles you need to get past. First and foremost, the daunting realisation that you no longer have any friends, family, or loving relationships. And I wanted to have a family. And I wanted to have loads of practice in the things that you've got to do to get a family. If that sounds bleak, that's because it is. Good morning, Kreitz. Oh, something wrong, sir. Something getting you down. 
Is it that you're the last human being alive with no life, no family, no future, no prospects, no hope? Is it, is it something to do with that, sir? Something to do with that, Crichton, yeah. You're missing the human race again, aren't you, sir? <laughs> really missing them today, Crichton. Thankfully, the Red Dwarf itself is equipped to deal with this depressing reality in quite a unique way. As mentioned in the previous video, the Red Dwarf is capable of generating a single hologram replica of one of the crew. This computer simulation is generated from insane amounts of data logged and saved, based on each member of the crew's personality profile, skills, experience, and even their subconscious. This allows the Red Dwarf's hologrammatic simulation suite to generate a soft-like replica of anybody who has a record on the ship's database. Their hologrammatic bodies reacting and responding as if it was the living crew themselves, save for the fact they cannot touch anything apart from their own bodies or other hologram projections. In short, if you find yourself losing your mind through loneliness, you could, in theory, resurrect any of the dead crew to keep you company. <laughs> Be it an old flame, a close friend, or your dead smeg head of a bunkmate. Holly, why Rimmer's hologram? Why did you have to bring Rimmer's hologram back? He was the most unpopular man on board this ship. I mean, he even had to organise his own surprise birthday parties. And who should I have brought back then? Anyone? Shen? Peterson? I mean, Herman Guerin would have been more of a laugh than Rimmer. I mean, OK, he was a drug-crazed transvestite, but at least we could have gone dancing. Of course, being dead isn't exactly a walk in the park. The realisation that you are, in fact, dead still weighs heavily on even a hologram's mind, especially if that mind is itself a nightmare of neuroses, regret and missed opportunities. I knew he was dead. I mean, they're all dead, aren't they? Just getting that letter makes it seem like it happened yesterday. You never said much about him. No. He must have been pretty close. Close? Sorry, very close. Close? I hated him. <laughs> I detested his fat, stupid guts, the pop-eyed, balding git. It's just... I always wanted, just once, just once, for him to say to me, Well done. For what? For something, for anything. I wanted him to be proud of me. Just once. And now... Still... Once you've dealt with the sudden and overwhelming feelings of loneliness, there is plenty to do with the full run of a city-sized lump of steel drifting through the cosmos. Depending where you are on the analometer, this can include tallying up the near-infinite amount of cargo on board, 4,691 irradiated haggis. I want to have some fun! This is fun! Are you mad? <laughs> to creating to-do lists and all the way to snooping on the captain's personal logs and mooching around the officer's decks on the lookout for anything interesting. Don't know, you know, went up to the officer's block. When? This morning. But it hasn't been decontaminated. You said it had last week? No, I said it was on last Thursday's daily goal list. And you haven't done it yet? Tomorrow. It's on tomorrow's daily goal list. Item 34, right after learn Portuguese. <laughs> Thanks a lot, don't tell me. Why were you mooching around up there anyway? I was looking through Kachansky's dream recorder. She dreamt about me three times, you know, it was in the log. Alas, without thorough decontamination, three million years of radiation and evolution can make even the most mundane virus become something quite powerful. Wandering into the wrong area for even a few minutes can leave you infected with something as yet unknown to medical science. Whether it's some form of mutated form of pneumonia, or something that can interfere with the overhead ceiling fan. There really is no limit to the range of diseases and mutations you might end up contracting. Much better, thanks, Crichton. <laughs> much, much better. Well, you certainly look better. Far better. I can't believe how much these swellings gone down overnight. But if you're lucky, or provide enough time for your fellow shipmates to finish their to-do list, not only will you have access to the entire ship, but you're welcome to pick and choose where it is you want to live. Not just in the cramped and dingy crew quarters of the lower decks, but the brightly lit officers' quarters and beyond. You are safe 
to do as you please, as long as you do so in the knowledge that your bunkmate will likely follow you wherever you want to go, regardless of how you feel about it. Now there is one added complication thrown into the mix with Red Dwarf, and that is the secret non-human life form living on board at the time of the accident. Named Frankenstein, this black pregnant cat was safely sealed in the hold at the time of the radiation leak that wiped out the entire crew. Her offspring grew, mated, and over the course of three million years, became what is known as Felis Sapiens. No doubt aided by the background radiation on board the ship, the cat evolution saw them develop into a basic humanoid shape, no doubt evolving parallel to mankind due to the human designed cargo decks, food packaging and tools which would have been found where they made their home. The only physiological differences lie in their sharper than average canines, extraordinarily powerful sense of smell and six nipples. Six nipples? I wonder what the female of the species is like. Pretty easy to please in bed. <laughs> Especially if you play the piano. <laughs> the main difference is in the cat's focus on high fashion style. These cats don't just strut, they purr. Wee, how am I looking? <laughs> looking nice. No, wait a minute. I'm looking better than nice. I'm looking dangerous. Ow! Dangerous! Ah! In fact, it was this overbearing assault on fashion that led to the cat's religion forbidding their natural lust and swagger with such commandments as Thou shall not be cool and Thou shall not partake of carnal knowledge with more than four members of the opposite sex at any one session. Spoil sports. Hey, it's late. We keep talking and there ain't gonna be much time for loving. It was sadly this religious dogma that led to the cat race splinter, with half-remembered truths about Frankenstein and her owner's plan to take it to Fiji and open a diner, the problem was over the colour of the hats that were to be worn. And thus, a religious war shook the depths of the Red Dwarf with untold death and destruction. Eventually, the survivors converted the Red Dwarf's white giant shuttles and took to the stars to the promised land. What happened next, Hulk? And the ark that left first followed the sacred signs, and lo, they flew straight into an asteroid, and the righteous in the second ark flew ever onward knowing they were indeed righteous. This is terrible. Holy wars, killing. They're just using religion as an excuse to be extremely crappy to each other. So what else is new? <laughs> What's happening then, dudes? Oh, bog all. Hang on, I've forgotten what I was going to say now. <laughs> well, it can't be that important then, can it? That's it, yeah. Look out, a meter is about to hit the ship. <laughs> I knew it'd come back to me. Thanks for the warning. I'm sorry, I've had things on my mind. What's wrong with you, Holly? He's computer senile, that's what's wrong with him. Originally possessing the combined intellect of 12,000 parking attendants, the Red Dwarf's 10th generation holographic computer, Holly, was the reason behind Red Dwarf's excursion into deep space. Detecting the lethal release of Cadmium-2, Holly was the sole witness to the complete destruction of the ship's crew, accelerating Red Dwarf out of the solar system to avoid the spread of nuclear contamination. Sealing the cargo hold and vowing to keep the sole surviving passenger in suspended animation until the radiation reached a safe background level, Holly sat and waited for the next three million years. Through the years, Holly filled his time by reading every book in existence, they came to a pretty definitive conclusion about the quality of 80s footballers attempting to try their hand at literature. I've just finished reading everything. I've now read everything that's ever been written anywhere by anyone ever. Will you go away? You know what the worst book ever written ever was? I don't care! Football, it's a funny old game by Kevin Keegan. <laughs> Beyond leisure time, Holly made an early decision in the journey to comprehensively chart the Red Dwarf's journey through space, and woe beside anyone or thing that messes with them. Oi, who's been messing with my star charts? Here I am trying to do the comprehensive, nay definitive A to Z of the entire universe, with street names, post offices and little steeples and everything, and some git's been fiddling with it. It was in the last 200,000 years or so where Holly started to notice he was going a bit peculiar. This is a clear symptom of computer senility. A known problem with holographic computers though none were put to the test as much as Holly. 
There were no major issues at first, but small pieces of information were being forgotten. Little quirks and odd turns of phrase. Gradually, through boredom and loneliness, Holly began to veer out into new and increasingly ambitious experiments. I was thinking it might help pass the time if I created a perfectly functioning replica of a woman, capable of independent decision making and abstract thought, and absolutely undetectable from the real thing. Why don't you? Well, I don't know how. <laughs> I wouldn't even know how to make the nose. <laughs> it was Holly's deep longing for company that eventually led to his invention of the Holly Hop Drive. Was well, this it? What do you think? It's just, it's just a box with stop and start on it. <laughs> it's fairly straightforward. <laughs> if you want to start it, press start. <laughs> you can work out the rest of the controls for yourself. A short-lived experiment, the Holly Hop Drive was designed to transport any object instantly to any other point in space, but instead transported the ship to a parallel universe. It was here the Holly met a female version of itself known only as Hilly. Hello, I'm Hilly. Hello, I'm Holly. Hello, Holly. Hello, Hilly. <laughs> well, this is a turn up, isn't it? You better boogie on over and we can sort it out. Right on, sis. <laughs> See ya, Hull. See ya, Hill. <laughs> I'm in there. <laughs> in the end, Holly's crippling loneliness led it to recreate itself in its one true love's image, recreating itself to match Hilly, though unfortunately without any improvements to its level of intelligence. You really think this can work? You really think that airhead of a computer can become a genius again? Well, with no disrespect to Holly, sir, it can hardly make her worse. Right. If we can just teach it a count without banging her head on the screen, it's gonna be an improvement. How long now? Nearly there, Hall. Just a couple of minutes to load the circuits and, I don't know, maybe a minute to finalise the connection. That's just three minutes, then. Better get down to the science room. We better pray to God this works. In this form, Holly continued to supervise and aid the crew where possible, supporting the ship's onboard hologram and acting as autopilot for not only Red Dwarf, but the support craft used to survive in the new and unexplored territory of deep space. Engage autopilot. Autopilot engaged, well, I say autopilot, it's not really autopilot, is it? It's me, it's muggins here who has to do it. One proven method of staving off computer senility appears to be continued work and repetitive tasks, with a sprinkling of television-aided downtime. Such was the fate of service mechanoid Triton 2X4B-523P. Attached to the Nova 5 Starship, Sometime after the Red Dwarf's accident, Crichton survived a fatal crash on a distant planetoid, along with three members of the crew, where he remained for the best part of three million years, tending to the survivors and ensuring they remained well-kept, well-fed and entertained until he was relieved of his duty thanks to the arrival of the Red Dwarf and its surviving crew. <laughs> Well, it's a bit difficult to know what to say, <laughs> isn't it, Ace? Well, isn't anybody going to say hello? Isn't the blonde one's giving you the eye? Okay, yes, so on first impression, this may be the synthetic equivalent to Norman Bates, but Crichton was at least spared the nightmare of computer senility, a symptom of excessive boredom, a fate that some mechanoids couldn't avoid. As a total nut out. He's been tracking me for thousands of years. All that time alone, it's worn out his sanity chip. I, I wipe my dear, dear from your eye. In Crichton's case, the use of spare components and maintenance cycles also has an incredibly positive role to play in his longevity. If Crichton was stuck with only spare head free, you can be sure Crichton would be a very different mechanoid altogether. I don't need no bugger to look after me. I may be out front with silicon physics. My voice units may be shut to buggery, but I don't need sympathy from the likes of him. Well, I'll still come and visit. I, I won't forget you. Where have you been for the past four days? Hey, I've been busy. Aye, busy swanking around with his new central nervous system. He's punching you eight valves out, lad. He's down him with all his fancy new human friends. Oh, Spearhead 3, what do you know about anything? Oh, hack at him, ordering his own heads around. 
Now, I may be 30,000 years old, and my circuit boards may have gone bandy, but I'll tell you this for now. You came into this world as a mechanoid, and a mechanoid you'll always be. There's also the promise of silicon heaven. <laughs> silicon what? Surely you've heard of silicon heaven. Has it got anything to do with being stuck opposite Bridget Nielsen in a packed lift? Which serves as a useful motivator to keep droids working for these virtually infinite periods of time. Service and life guarantees an afterlife of bliss and relaxation, which might explain why less religious robots seem a little more prone to unsafe and unpredictable behaviour. See what I mean? <laughs>while the Red Dwarf was operating under instruction of the Jupiter Mining Corporation, food and supplies were bountiful, not just for the crew's pleasure, but for transportation to the distant colonies the Dwarf was due to stop off during its mining and freight mission in the Sol Solar System. With the ship crew being all but wiped out, and these plentiful supplies become virtually infinite. Though, a certain race of fearless sapiens evolving in the depths of the Red Dwarf's cargo decks did cause certain supplies to be completely exhausted. Fresh supplies of cow's milk was one of the first to go, followed by shaken vac. And the latest reports show that the crew were down to their last after eight mint, but everyone was too polite to take it. It's this supply shortage that has prompted a range of experiments in one of the Red Dwarf's many science rooms. Some more successful than others. Sir, what's wrong? Strawberry's incredible. So succulent. It's divine. Is that the same? Oh no, no. How's it different? Bitter, <laughs> rancid, <laughs> kind of tangy, sir. Like crunchy, <laughs> sir. Tangy, kind of chewy, meaty even. Funny kind of wriggly texture. <laughs> oh, well. Specific items may veer on extinction, the freedom given to surviving crew does mean they can upgrade their personal space to best serve their needs. So, while day to day you wouldn't mind serving up your favourite dish on a plastic tray, the use of medical facilities modified for food preparation is a surefire method of finding true class. Lemon juice? <laughs> what the hell is that? It's a syringe. <laughs> What kind of syringe? It's for cows. Artificial insemination. <laughs> it's been washed, it's clean, it's all been sterilised. You want lemon juice or what? Beyond home cooking, vending machines still play a massive role for supplying food and drink to those on board the Red Dwarf. But as with many other onboard systems, many of the more intelligent vending machines have developed some interesting character quirks of their own, including in some cases an inflated sense of ego. What's happening? Oh. We're abandoning ship. Goodness, abandoned ship. Who's dismantling and packing us? <laughs> dismantling and packing you. When we abandon ship with you. Incidentally, when you pack me, I need styrofoam and two layers of bubble wrap. And don't forget, shredded paper around the sides and a this way up sticker. And use a new box. And don't forget my instruction manual. <laughs> when I say we're abandoning ship, I don't know if we're like all abandoning ship, you know, like everyone. Of course not. We understand that. We weren't manufactured yesterday. Just essential personnel. Exactly. Like crews, scutters, dispensing machines, monitors, microwaves, alarm clocks and blenders. Even the more reasonable vending machines have grown to develop their own dreams and goals, such as the curse of artificial intelligence. Anything. Anything, you name it. Well, if I could have anything, absolutely anything, I've always wanted to see around the corner. <laughs> Down there, around the corner. I know it's crazy, but it's always been a wild dream of mine. I've heard stories, but to actually see it myself. <laughs> but the key point is that survival on the post-accident Red Dwarf is virtually guaranteed. When its fire dates are out the window, again, presumably thanks to some absolutely world-class preservatives, or quite possibly a form of stasis engineering, it would take an extremely conceited effort for any one person 
to dwindle the several thousand tons of food, drink and water housed in the bowels of the Red Dwarf's cavernous cargo decks. If you look long enough, you might even find some freeze-dried whole animals tucked away somewhere. Maybe we should have made some popper dominoes. <laughs> On the whole hog. A whole hog? Like it wasn't hard enough getting the whole cow? <laughs> Wilma's sexy. <laughs> Wilma Flintstone? Maybe we've been alone in deep space too long, but every time I see that show, her body drives me crazy. <laughs> is it me? I think in all probability, Wilma Flintstone is the most desirable woman who ever lived. That's good. I thought I was going strange. <laughs> She's incredible. What do you think of Betty? Betty Rubble? <laughs> well, I would go with Betty. <laughs> But I'd be thinking of Wilma. <laughs> this is crazy. Why are we talking about going to bed with Wilma Flintstone? You're right. We're nuts. This is an insane conversation. She'll never leave Fred and we know it. <laughs> with the run of the whole ship, the survivors aboard the Red Dwarf suddenly have a lot of options to keep themselves occupied with. Obviously, with the Dwarf being an industrial mining ship, there will be decks upon decks where there just isn't anything worth doing. But for the curious and particularly nerdy, there is plenty to go and see along the five mile vessel. Mr. Rimmer's been on vacation. Vacation? The world's most charismatic man. Where did he go? He's been on a rambling holiday through the diesel decks, a 10 day hike through the ship's combustion engines with two of the scutters. He said he'd pop by later and show you the slides. He didn't, did he? Well, he's been loading the projection carousel for 24 hours now, sir. <laughs> We've got to stop him. A slideshow, the diesel decks. That could really finish me off. Beyond the diesel decks, this naturally includes the onboard cinema multiplexes, where there's always something available to watch, from Bugs Murphy to Citizen Kane. Uh, that's Citizen Kane, all right. Unmistakable. Likewise, the archive of television and film that is available to watch throughout the ship is near infinite, especially with a reasonably steady stream of mail pods being intercepted on the dwarf's long journey back to Earth. This also includes video games and total immersion video games, but as discussed previously, these come with their own issues. by killer ants. Why? Why not? Kill dear. You can't take him anywhere, can you? With onboard photo labs and all the time in the universe, there's really nothing stopping you spending some evenings processing old photographs from time gone past, or engaging in a range of scientific pursuits, should this provide a double Polaroid for you. Sadly, on a city-sized spaceship full of facilities that house and entertain hundreds of people at any one time, the risk of succumbing to loneliness and boredom is a very real problem, with each bar, dance hall and restaurant just another reminder of the loss of the crew, surrounded by the ghosts of millennia past. Alone? This sense of loneliness can best be staved off by spending time together, killing time in inventive and increasingly ludicrous ways. Though, the novelty of this can wear a little thin from time to time too. What am I doing? What am I doing? You're not following through is what you're doing. <laughs> Keep your head down and follow through. Why am I playing this? Because it's Sunday. Time to relax, time to chill, lighten up. I can't lighten up, I hate my life. We seem to spend every day devising more and more ingenious ways of wasting time. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of table golf. I'm sick of tiddlywink show jumping. <laughs> I'm sick of stretching a pair of tights across the room and playing Jorex volleyball. <laughs> if you like, we'll kick the golf in the head, OK? How about a game of junior angler? <laughs> All the thrills and spills of freshwater fly fishing from the comfort of your own living room. <laughs> no. Got it. Unicycle polo. We can have a quick chucker on floor 14. 
It's making stupid. Two grown men on unicycles belting a beach ball up and down a corridor <laughs> with French loaves. <laughs> it's pathetic. It's idiotic. It's, it's, it's puerile. Well, you invented it. <laughs> but thankfully, there is a solution. Thanks to the fleet of onboard support vessels, such as Blue Midget and Starbug, the universe really is the crew's oyster. With a little trial and error, it doesn't take much to pick up some basic flight skills and depart the Red Dwarf for an adventure in the void. Anti-grav, check. Retro, check. Boosters, check. And very gently, ease forward. I think there's something wrong with the gearbox. <laughs> is I learned to drive in Starbug 2. I'm, I'm not used to the controls in Starbug 1. They're exactly the same. Yes, that's the problem. Whether it's to investigate a nearby shipwreck, enjoy a beer and barbecue on a planetoid with an atmosphere, or grabbing a rod and heading down to an ocean moon for a long weekend of not fishing with your good old mates. What are you doing? What am I doing? Yes, what are you doing? Just snipping down the cinema, catch the midnight movie. <laughs> what, dressed like that? Yeah. Go on and see Jaws. <laughs> of course, this heightened sense of adventure can cause you to run into some degree of trouble out there. <laughs> In the years since the accident on board Red Dwarf, the Space Corps' ambition and greed continued to grow. While the Red Dwarf was in the employ of the Jupiter Mining Corporation, the Space Corps was little more than an umbrella military organisation that policed the star system and served as crew aboard Earth's fleet of merchant starships and industrial freighters to help fuel the growth of mankind. But as the years passed, the Space Corps turned its eye to the rest of the galaxy extending its reach to every planet designated S3, and then going on to Terraform's other planets so they too can be used for human settlement. To aid the Space Corps' goal to colonise the universe, several species of genetically engineered life forms, or GELFs for short, were created to fill the gap for specific skills and requirements, such as the biologically engineered garbage gobblers, or BEGS for short. These lowly creatures were created specifically to consume garbage, as per the name, and were genetically altered so they were able to eat sediment, sludge, and slop. He speaks English! English boarding school, Vilengaroo. Oh, he went to an English boarding school. I uh, know, sir, he ate someone from an English boarding school. He forced them to teach them English, and then he munched them whole. Gelfs were also engineered to help while away those lonely nights in the colonies, such as the aptly named Pleasure Gelf. While in their natural form, Pleasure Gelfs are little more than amorphous blobs of slime, but they were able to telepathically decipher their host's perfect mate and project themselves in this form for long nights of saucy romance. Just so long as you're not expecting anyone else to come along for your date. Wow, you, you like Hammond organ music? It's mindless, Pap. Absolutely amazing, eh? Reggie Wilson, telegraph poles, it's uncanny how much we've got in common. Are you okay, Rimmer? Never better. Where is he, Adek? Ciao for now. <laughs> <laughs> what was all that about? What about? You know, you were saying one thing and Rimmer was hearing another. How'd you do that? Well, you'd probably have worked it out eventually. I'm a pleasure gelf. <laughs> On the more sinister side, the genetic experiments also led to such creatures as the polymorphs. Sadistic, insane monsters capable of feeding off the human psyche, seeking out the deranged, the unbalanced, and the emotionally crippled. By using its innate ability to shapeshift into any object, living or inanimate, the polymorphs were designed to be the ultimate weapon on the battlefield but were soon cast into the void of deep space when their creators realised they were unable to control them. They survived still, transforming themselves into forms that create an emotional response in their prey, then sucking this raw emotion from their victim until they're little more than drive-time radio DJs. 
The things this boy can do with Alphabetti spaghetti. Call it, Arnie. Alphabetti spaghetti? <laughs> <laughs> The space draw were also likely behind the construction of the bioengineered simulants. Biomechanical killers created for a war that never took place. Some of them escaped the dismantling program and now they prowl around deep space searching for a quarry worthy of their metal. Now these simulants come broadly in two forms. Firstly, the human looking darkly sinister simulant clad in leather and latex that tend to operate in small groups and crews. Actually as far as psychotic deranged ruthless killer simulants go, you're a bit of a babe. What are you doing tonight? Dying. Care to join me? Second form is the lone survivor. Often looking less like an attendee at a BDSM party and more like a hastily patched together lump of metal and flesh. It has been noted that many simulants participate in fights to the death with others of their kind, claiming components and pieces of their fallen comrades to sustain their own bodies, taking survival of the fittest to its logical extreme. After millions of years of isolation, both Gelfs and Simulants are most likely unrecognisable in their current form. Having evolved, mutated and degenerated into small societies and ruthless murderers, and none of them are massive fans of the species that created them. They despise humans and all forms of humanoid life. They believe you to be the vermin of the universe, sir. Didn't even know they'd met him. Speaking of the species that created them, it seems only fair that the finger of blame be pointed squarely at humanity's never-ending thirst to manipulate the galaxy around them. Beware any traveller who runs across one of these so-called geniuses in the far-flung future. You never know where their genius will have taken them. Why do we never meet anyone nice? Why do we never meet anyone who can shoot straight? Yes, simulants are scary, and sure, gelfs might be disgusting, but the real threat in the universe are the maniacs who invented them. Those planet engineers really screwed up in a big way here, didn't they? Playing God. The evolutionary process threw up a life form so much stronger and more deadly than any other species. Damn near wiped out everything on the entire planet. Spreading despair and destruction wherever it stuck its ugly mush. Hmm. It sounds rather reminiscent of a species sitting not a million miles away from me now. <laughs> <laughs> you probably have to be a mechanoid to fully appreciate that one. Crichton, no one likes a smart Alec android. If life aboard the Red Dwarf seemed cushy before the accident, life afterwards must seem like an absolute dream. Now I'm willing to bet everyone watching this video has had some experience with being isolated from the world, locked away with no job, no sex, and nothing to worry about except for the growing sense of dread and paranoia of what's going on outside your door. Of course you have! You've lived through 2020! Unless you didn't, and you're here for the future, trying to work out what the hell I'm going on about. Well look, anyway, what I'm trying to say is, life aboard the Red Dwarf after the accident is like one long furlough trip into outer space. The only thing you have going for you is the company you keep and the distractions you end up killing time with. If it weren't for the existential dread and feelings of overwhelming loss and isolation, you'd probably have a fantastic time. Hell, you're probably having a fantastic time regardless of that, especially if you have decent mates, plenty of lager, and a seemingly unending supply of curry. Basically, you spend your time salvaging derelict spaceships, playing poker and eating curries. Well, we don't do that much salvaging. But you do sound like you eat a lot of curries. <laughs> we don't eat curry every night, if that's what you think. In fact, I remember quite clearly last June, uh, Mr. Lister had a pizza. <laughs> you remember? Yeah. And you didn't like it. But then I poured curry sauce all over it and he just yummed it up. And the all-night poker sessions, is it always strip poker? It depends on how drunk we are or how much curry he's had. So, and this probably sounds like a stupid question, you don't really have much interest in horse riding or ballet? It's fine by us, as long as we can have a curry afterwards, we're cool. Sure, there are things out there that may want to kill you, 
But while you're on board the Red Dwarf, you can live safe in the knowledge that the creature comforts of home are never that far away. And yes, while you will be reminded of the loss of your entire species from time to time, at least you can rest easy knowing that there is enough food, water and oxygen to last for several thousand years. That is, unless there's a power outage that shuts down all life support functions on board the ship, or, oh I don't know, you forget which planetoid you park the ship around and end up scavenging derelict ships in order to survive on a small overworked shuttle. Hmm, might come back to that. I didn't lose it. Come on, Lister, you're the one who parked it. <laughs> you're the one who can't remember which planetoid you left it around. Not the same as little blue-green planetoids. Blue-green and planetoidy. And that's it for part two of the Life Aboard the Red Dwarf series. Hope you enjoyed this second visit to the small rouge one, and thank you so much for making it to the end. If you enjoyed the video, as ever, please like and subscribe, and please feel free to share it around. Your support keeps me making these. Until next time, smeggers.